Hello, I'm Luga Torix, and welcome to my France Faction Guide for Medieval 2 Total War. Today we're going to be discussing campaign strategy, the units involved in the French campaign, and just some general tips about buildings and so on and so forth about this campaign. On the grand campaign, of course, Medieval 2 Total War single player. So France, as you'd imagine, occupies this region, which is kind of modern day France, just isn't completely unified, it's the blue region, and its strengths are fields the best heavy cavalry in the west and good infantry in the late period. Weaknesses are relatively weak infantry in the early period. So there you go. And the campaign rules on long are to hold 45 regions including Jerusalem region. Which of course is around here where Jerusalem is. So first of all we're going to have a look at the different units involved in the French campaign. And then we'll talk some campaign strategy. So here are the French units. And we'll start off with the typical peasants. As the game says, and I repeat this every time, peasants are literally only useful for cannon fodder, have terrible stats. Don't ever rely on peasants because, well, they're just not going to do anything. They are un they are reluctant to fight, basically. They are unwilling to fight, but they have to sometimes. Basically, don't use them unless you have to. Next up, town militia. Again, I say this every time. Town militia are only really a small step up from peasants. They're just slightly more willing. They have slightly better stats. Attack of 5, defense of 7. Slightly more defensive. Because they're kind of like spearmen, but like short spears they have. So not particularly good. Yeah, I mean, town militia are okay in the very, very early stage. Okay, so pike militia. Now these guys are interesting because they are spearmen. Like the ones we just looked at but they have a defense of one and an attack of seven if you compare them to the town militia they have a, an attack of five so they have a slightly better attack but a really terrible defense now the fact they have very long spears means they have a decent defense just by proxy the fact they have long spears it's not easy to physically get to them but still and they can they can form a spear wall which is kind of the same principle that you can't really get to them still though a defensive one very very trash and they get like a cavalry charge or something into the side of the back they are done for and they are very vulnerable to missiles evidently because they're poor defense okay next up pikemen well-trained unit of pikes can create an almost impenetrable wall of steel of course like most sort of spearmen -y type units they are effective against cavalry attack of nine which is pretty solid for the early game Although this says they're late game troops, so I guess not. Uh, attack of 9, defense of 3, charge bones of 3. Slightly better than the ones we just looked at, but again, nothing special. But the fact they have very long spears and can form a spear wall means that defense of 3 is kind of illusory. It's not very, um, in the sense that it sort of underestimates how good these guys are at defending because they can form a sort of defensive formation. Still though, as I said before, vulnerable to missiles, so they will just collapse under cavalry charge or missiles. Spear Militia, these guys I've mentioned a lot before as well. Attack of 5, defense of 7, so pretty, you know, standard troops. But they are spears, they are militia troops, meaning they are okay at defending a position because they form a skill drum, which is kind of like a phalanx. It's a defensive spear formation. So these guys are decent in that regard. And then we get onto Sergeant Spearmen. Now, Sergeant Spearmen are a step up. Attack of 7, which is pretty solid for spear. You know, a defensive troop to have attack of seven is not bad because they are a defensive troop defense of nine which is a bit higher because you know they're better the skill trim is decent the bonus fighting cavalry these guys are just a slightly more solid version of the spearmen we've been looking at um earlier on and then we have armored sergeants now armored sergeants they are protected by a large shield and mail so they actually have some sort of armor armed with spears so they are still spears and they uh, are able to form a defensive ring of spears, kind of like the other guys as well. Attack of 7, pretty good. But the defense of 14 means these guys are pretty good at defending a spot. A situation um, where they have to defend, I don't know, a town or a passageway or a, a certain point. Yeah, these guys can do a solid job because they will just stand there, hold their ground in the skill trim. That's what these guys are for, and they will do that job. And that armor means they are not vulnerable to missiles, certainly not as much as the previous troops, which are just basically armed with a shirt, nothing much. Right, now these guys, I've been trying to work out how to say, uh, also pronounce these, Volmilis? I don't know. You can read it. I obviously cannot read it. The point is, they hold a versatile 
Volge. I don't know how to say that. I'm probably saying it completely wrong. It's kind of um, like a uh, pole arm kind of thing. It's a long, very, very long spear, basically. Can form a spear wall. Decent defense. A bit underwhelming attack, but they are a defensive formation. The fact that they can have a very, uh, very long spears and can form a spear wall, though, means they are relatively impenetrable in that regard. And of course, it means they are effective against sort of cavalry and that kind of thing, or anything that's in a long, sort of protracted melee. Effective against armor as well is good because if you start going against factions that are maybe slightly more developed than you are, the fact that they are effective against armor kind of nullifies that. So then, further on, we have Volgier. Yes, my French pronunciation isn't very good. The point is, these guys are slightly better versions, basically. Slightly better attack, slightly better defense, with a bit of a charge bonus, which is kind of pointless for spearmen, but whatever. Can form a spear wall, etc, etc. Effect effective against armor. Very similar, just slightly better. Slightly better, and the, as I say, the fact they have very long spears is pretty cool indeed. Next up, Dismounted Noble Knights. Now we've, uh, I've mentioned these guys before, but I'll mention them again just quickly. Made up of the French nobility, these elite warriors are as deadly on foot as when mounted. Attack of 21, way, way higher than anything we've seen so far. I think the highest we've seen so far is 9, so that is over double what anyone else can do so far as what we've looked at. And the fact they still have a good defence is pretty cool as well. And they're effective against armour, combat bonus, yeah, whatever. Good morale. Morale is very, very important in every situation. Well armoured themselves, which means that they're going to be hard to take down. So that defence of 13 is actually a bit better as well because they have good armour. Um, so you're going to have to have something that's really armour piercing to get through these guys. Very, very solid troop, but obviously more expensive than the others. You can look at these prices and you look at this one, slightly more expensive because you're getting a better troop. Still though, we get onto the early period dismounted feudal knights. If you look at the stats, 13 and 21, 21 and 13, so it's kind of transposed. This is a more defensive unit, but still very competent in the attack. Knights would often dismount and fight on foot when the situation demanded it, so dismounted, they make excellent heavy infantry. And they do, because they're very, very good defense in particular. Good morale, well armored, they will stand their ground, they'll do their thing and they'll just chop through troops, which is exactly what you want out of heavy infantry indeed. Then we have dismounted chivalric knights. Now these guys, attack of 13, defense of 22, so slightly better defense. They're high period, so later period uh, troops than what we've just looked at. Um, but still, the fact that they are well armored is pretty cool indeed. Similar, just slightly better, particularly on the defensive side. Then we have peasant archers. Now archers, well, I've mentioned peasant archers a lot again, if you've looked at my previous faction guides, but I'll say it again. They're solid, they're okay, they will not do anything in the melee at all. If you compare them to normal peasants, they're actually slightly worse in the melee. But a missile attack of 5 is underwhelming, but it's better than nothing. You get them on a the high position, they'll do a little bit, particularly with the flaming missiles, they might scare some cavalry or whatever. Then we have peasant crossbowmen. Now these guys, again, also completely incompetent in the melee, but a much better missile attack. Nearly double, 9 missile attack is a lot better. And the good thing about crossbowmen is they are effective against armor. So if they're going up against knights, maybe that have armor, they'll do a lot better job. Whereas the peasant archers, they just won't do that much to them. So crossbowmen, obviously better. And still pretty cheap looking at it as well. Then we have crossbow militia. Very, very similar. Crossbow militia are peasant crossbowmen called up to defend settlements. Very poorly armed. Sort of a defensive crossbow unit. Put them up on the walls. They'll do a job. It's pretty similar to like I've said before. Then we have crossbowmen. Now, the difference with these crossbowmen is they have the same missile attack. They are effective against armor, which is good. The difference is that their melee attack is better. Now, this is something I've mentioned before. I'll mention it again. How important is it really for crossbowmen to have missile attack? Uh, sorry, melee attack. It's very important to have missile attack. Melee attack is what I meant. Well, that can be debated, but... It's still nice just to know that if they do need to fight, they're not going to collapse straight away. I could compare them to Cretan archers in Rome Total War, because Rome Total War, Cretan archers, you can sort of rely on them in the melee as a last resort. And it means, of course, they're not completely useless after they run out of arrows slash missiles, whatever, bolts in this case. Okay, these guys again. Uh, the reason I don't like these guys is not because of anything to do with the game, as such, is because I can't pronounce them, and I haven't learned to pronounce them yet, and I probably should. Archiv 
I mean, you can read it. I can't. Again, I can't read it. I'm a bit stupid. But you can read it. It doesn't matter. You'll recognise these guys when you see them. Fired at close range, this noisy, smoky and lethal weapon causes morale damage as well as physical hurt. Late period, obviously, because it's a firearm. Um, okay in the melee. Not amazing, particularly on defence. The good thing about these guys, of course, though, the missile attack is 14. Nearly triple what the peasant archers can do. But obviously, they're having a uh, bow and arrow. These guys have got a firearm. So they're obviously going to have a much higher missile attack. And of course, that means that they are very, very good against armour. But they are vulnerable to missiles themselves, which is kind of ironic. Probably because they're wearing stupid hats and a little t-shirt rather than proper armour. Whatever. Then we have a, I nearly said adventurer. It's not. It's aventuria. Pronunciation, I don't know. Anyway, the good thing about these are, they are basically the same as these guys, but they are a lot better. Particularly in the melee, you can see attack of 11, defense of 15, so very, very good. In fact, better than some of these guys, which is very interesting. But of course, late periods, they're going to cost a lot of money, so that's why they're better. But also, also, good morale, which for melee, uh, sorry, missile troops is pretty cool indeed. It means they won't break straight away if they're hit. Long range missiles, again, very, very cool. Means you can engage your enemy before they can engage you. Start getting hit and morale damage before they've even seen you. Particularly if they're high up on a hill or whatever. So, excellent. Well armoured, good stamina. These guys are hard to take down. Especially when they're firing bolts or whatever in your face. You know what I'm saying? Then we have dismounted French archers. Attack of 11, defence of 14, so decent in the melee. Not so good in the missile, but... They're archers, so, you know, these are basically elite archers. They're not, maybe, you could argue, not quite as good as these guys, in a sense that their missile attack's not as good, but these are close-range guys, whereas these guys, their missiles are bow and arrows, so they can fire further. Then, you know, they're slightly more long range, and it says there it is longer-range missiles. Combat bonus, blah, 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 effective against armor, which is good, particularly in the late stage, because a lot of the troops have good armor, so it's important to have stuff that can counter that. Good morale, good stamina. These are the elite archers of the French army. Scots Guard. Yes, Scots Guard in France. Scots Guard in France. Who would have thought it, eh? These Scottish troops are elite armoured longbowmen and form part of the French King's Guard. There's probably some historical reason behind this. This is not my period of history that I know anything about. I know about the... <sighs> The Holocaust and about the Roman, early Roman military a little bit. This is not my period. I do not know why there are Scots Guard in the French army. Maybe someone can tell me. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Attack of 12, defense of 17. Very, you look at some of these. We've looked at heavy infantry and their defense of 17 is just, it's just not there. So, defense of 17 is very good. Some of them are obviously up to 21, but whatever. Missile attack of 9 is good. Long range missiles, it's a lot of repetition here, so you can see the stats, they're pretty good. Scots in France, what's that about? Anyway, cavalry, now the cavalry is, you know, everyone's going on about, oh, the French cavalry is great. Well, let's see how great they are. Early mounted sergeants, attack of 9, defense 13. Pretty solid start because this early cavalry, early cavalry that wear light armor, have a spear and a sword because they can't decide what kind of troop they want to be. And defense of 13 for a cavalry at any stage is pretty decent. It's all right. Bear in mind they're not wearing armor, like heavy armor, I mean. You know, anything like that. For a light sort of cavalry unit, pretty solid defense. Pretty solid attack as well. I've seen a lot worse than that. And as I said, and as the game said earlier, the French cavalry is the best in the West. And uh, you can already see a little bit of evidence of that in the early, early stage. Next up, Merchant Cavalry Militia. Pretty similar stats, Slightly low attack, slightly high defense, well armored. So they're basically, they're poorly trained, but they are decent armored. They're all right. They've got a better shield, which has got, that looks like a German thing on the shield. But uh, well, I don't know, whatever, who cares? Next up, mailed knights. Now, this is where the improvements are really evident. Because the mail, basically. Uh, the mail armor, which they are encased in, as it says there. Defense of 14, which is very, very solid. And the fact that they are, they, they have a sort of male armor means that early archers, for example, won't be able to hit them as well. They won't be as effective. Good morale, good stamina means they're hard to break down as well. They can fight a little bit longer, which is cool for cavalry. A lot of cavalry just can't fight for a long time. They're good at like one-off charges and then they kind of just get stuck and they're like, Ugh. 
early period for this kind of stuff to be evident is pretty cool indeed. Attack of 10, again, is good as well. Let's have a look at a blue horse. Yes, a blue horse. Uh, attack of 10, which is the same. Defense of 16. Bear in mind, this is still early period. Still early period. Feudal Knights, by the way, I forgot to say. Still early period. So to see 10 and 16 and 6 on an early period cavalry, pretty good indeed, I would say. Uh, can form wedge. May charge without orders. That's not ideal. Doesn't happen that often in my experience. Good morale, well armoured. Again, if it's hard to take cavalry down, that's really awesome. Look how much cavalry the French have, by the way. It's ridiculous. It really is ridiculous. Let's scroll down a little bit. Another blue horse. But the blue horse, you know, being ridden by a man completely in armour. Yeah, superb. I think it's meant to say superbly well armoured, but whatever. Superb, well armoured, professional heavy cavalry. Professional, so they won't charge out orders. Heavy cavalry armed with a lance. It is late period, obviously, but these guys are good. Attack of 10, which is solid, as I said, for cavalry as well. Coupled with a charge bonus of 8. Well, that's pretty good, isn't it? Attack of 15 is the highest we've seen yet. Good morale, very well armoured, powerful charge, good stamina, good unit overall. Chunky lads, which is a bit odd for me to say, but whatever. Right, General's Bodyguard. Early period General's Bodyguard. Obviously, you expect the General's Bodyguard to be good, and these guys are good. Even in the early period. 13 attack. Very, very good. I think that's the best we've seen. 13 attack. 16 defense. Again, very, very solid. Well armoured. Very good stamina. Good morale. Hard to take these guys down. But obviously, less of the unit unless you've got the faction leader or faction heir than some of these guys. And obviously, they're less, uh, you know, you can't recruit them or whatever. But still, pretty solid stuff. Two hit points. Then we have the late period general's bodyguard. Basically, just a slight improvement. You can see the stats. They've gone up very, very slightly. They're just that little bit better. A little bit well armoured. This horse is no longer blue. It is, in fact, encased in some sort of Terminator robot thing. Casing. Cool. Then we have Knights Templar. Yeah, we're getting into the fancy stuff now. The really fancy stuff. Elite and some say reckless knights formed to protect Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land. So, um, yeah, if anyone's... If anyone's fighting for their religion, they always fight a little bit harder. That's what my experience is. 13 attack, 16 defense. I mean, this is like comparable to some of the late heavy infantry. 16 defense on cavalry. Very good. Well armoured, etc, etc. Powerful charge of 8. A charge of 8, which is up there with the likes of generals on some Knights Templar. Pretty cool, I would say. Right, up next. Knights Hospitalier. Probably saying that wrong. Well trained and disciplined, these knights are amongst the deadliest heavy cavalry in all of Christendom. I think I've mentioned these guys before because you use them often on crusades because they're religious seat people. Attack of 13, defense of 16, charge bonuses of 8, and you can see the stuff there. They're solid lads. I don't want to go over the same stuff over and over again. You can see the stats. You can see they're good. Back to more blue horses and high period chivalric knights. 13, 17, defense, very, very solid. May charge out orders. I mean, these guys, you know, because they're fighting for their religion or whatever, you know, like these lads, they might be a little bit more, more reckless, but they're good. The thing is, yeah, they may charge out orders, but they're probably going to charge in something and decimate them. So, hey, it's not too bad. If they're going to charge in something, you might as well charge into it well. And these guys charge in stuff well. Noble Knights, high period, very similar. It's all very, very similar. They're very, very good cavalry. You have a good selection of very, very good cavalry as France. That's what I've got from this. And then lastly, or second to last, because I missed that last guy, Lancers. Late period, similar, but they're the ultimate knight, superbly protected by sophisticated plate armour. This is about as well armoured as you can get. Really is. Okay, as I said earlier, it's a bit like the Terminator kind of stuff. You just won't die. Powerful charge of eight. Again, comparable to generals. Good morale. Yet they made charge without orders. Who cares? Because they are indestructible machines of war. That's my opinion. Then we have the high period French mounted archers. Now, I'm a big fan of horse archers, particularly in Rome Total War. That's why I do the Scythia campaign, is because I love horse archers and spamming those bastards. The problem with uh, Scythian horse archers in Rome Total War is they are completely incompetent in the melee, and if they get attacked in the melee, they are screwed. Not these guys, which makes them ridiculously overpowered. Missile attack of 7 is good. When you're on a horse, that's fine. That's all you need. Attack of 9, which is comparable to early light cavalry, on a missile horse cavalry person is very, very good. 
but defence of 14. My god, I wish the Scythian horse archers had a defence of 14. That would be beautiful, but they don't, unfortunately. Yeah, so these guys can do their stuff in the melee if required. They won't just collapse straight away. Very, very powerful French horses are pretty good. Now, I'm not going to go over the um, siege equipment and all this stuff like trebuchets and cannons because I went over it in the first faction guide, which I believe was England. So if you want to see that, go back to the England faction guide or whatever the first one I did. I think it was England. Uh, and you can have a look at these guys um, because I've discussed them already. Don't want to repeat myself. Let's just have a look at the special sort of mercenary troops. We have religious fanatics early period. And while they are fanatical, the problem is they forgot to put armor on, which, you know... They're a motley assortment of zealots and maniacs from amongst the common folk of Europe travelling to the Holy Land. So they're sort of um, crusade-y kind of people. Attack of 13, defence of 1, charge bonus of 6. Notice defence of 1. But they have good morale, which kind of makes up for it, but they will just die. But they will also hack a few heads off in the process. So yeah, if you want some committed troops, these are your guys. Then we have a high period Flemish pikemen. Hailing from Flanders, these mercenaries are armed with pikes and wear light armour. 9, 8 and 3 with very long spears and as I mentioned earlier, very long spears with a spear wall means their defence is actually a little bit higher than you'd really think they are because they can form a good defensive formation. And finally we have the Swiss pikemen. Yes, Switzerland is not a faction but you, are, you guys are represented by some pikemen, so good for you. Attack of 14 is good. Very, very good. They're very brave and fierce. I'm looking at the description. They're very, very good. Attack of 14. Defense of 5 is a little bit underwhelming, but they have very long spears. Can form a spear wall, so as I said, that's not as bad as you'd think. May charge out orders well, then mercenary people, whatever. They're going to do that. Good morale. Very good stamina. They will stand up, they will fight, and they'll do some damage. you got to like some Swiss pikemen in your army. Right, so what we'll do now is we'll have a look at the little video that plays before the campaign starts, and then I'll talk some strategy. That's what I'll do. France stands proud and powerful. Notions of courtly love have ushered in an era of nobility and chivalry. The legacy of Charlemagne still resonates with noble and commoner alike. Europe is a continent divided by mistrust and centuries of violence. As crusades carve a bloody swathe in the distant east, the ideals of chivalry and honor are tested time and again. In times of war, much is sacrificed. Countless lives are lost to battle and honor so that a kingdom can prosper. Excellent. Okay, so here we are. And as you can see, actually, the French Empire, or the French faction, whatever you want to call them, has a pretty large and numerous starting empire comparatively to everyone else. I think really it's only rivaled by the Seljuks who are in a much weaker position just in general. So you have a pretty good starting position in some respects. We'll talk about that in a second. But the first thing I'm going to do is the first thing I do every time, which is I'm going to remove the fog of war. As I say every time, I'm not going to, I never play without the fog of war. I consider it cheating, but just for the purpose of showing you everything that's on the map so you can see it clearly, I'm going to get rid of that old thing. And there we go. So we can see what's going on. And, yep, yeah, here we go. You start off with five settlements, which is a lot. I think it is the most in the game. Five settlements. 
Ah, now there, <laughs> there is a problem. Uh, the only problem is I'm not French and I don't know how to pronounce these names. I'll pronounce the ones that I know. There's this one, there's Paris, there's this one, there's Toulouse and there's Marseille. Three out of five, not a bad percentage, I'd say. I don't know. It's not too bad. You can read. Hopefully, you can read better than I can. I just, I don't know how to say these two, and I don't want to embarrass myself. And I also don't want to look them up. So, you know, this is what we have. Anyway. Anyway. So, the first thing I do is, it's a relatively similar situation to Spain in uh, Rome Total War. And what I say with Spain is, what you got to do, first of all, just consolidate the empire. It's actually an easier job because than Spain because it's not rival Carthaginian and French factions. In fact, it's a lot of rebel settlements around you. So what I would do is I'd scramble for these rebel settlements before anyone else gets them, including the English, the Danish, and the Holy Roman Empire-ish. That's what I'd do. So, Ren... Okay, thank you for glitching out on me. Ren and Bordeaux are obvious targets. You want to get to Ren before this geezer, Captain Robin, gets to it, but for sure... Um, that's nice. And we'll talk about why it's important, in my opinion, to get to settlements before other factions do. Hint, because we're Catholic. Anyway, so Rain and Bordeaux, you want to get to them pretty quickly. Wouldn't bother going for Zaragoza or Zaragoza, I don't know how you say it. Just wouldn't bother. Don't go down that far south, in my opinion. Um, you've got Bern, which you could probably try and take before the Holy Roman Empire. Definitely Dijon and definitely Metz. And I would also try and go for Antwerp and Bruges. But Bruges you might not be able to get before um, the English. Not a big deal. Uh, if you don't. Whatever. So, yeah. You've got a lot of rebel settlements around you is what I'm trying to say. At which point, the map will start to look a bit more like France. A lot of blue in this kind of region. Because you've picked up the rebel settlements. Good for you. So, once you've done that, it should be relatively simple. You have armies like this geezer ready to take settlements. You have a little bit of garrison here. You know, you have this geezer, Captain Gaston. Who's ready to take Bordeaux and Rennes and whatever. Good. So you have that situation sorted out. Now, the reason why it's important to get to these settlements before your rival Catholic factions do is because of a man called the Pope. Now, the Pope will be annoyed if you attack a faction. So, for example, if England get to Rennes first and you think, I want Rennes, well, you're going to have to attack a Catholic faction and the Pope isn't going to like it. It's much better if you say, right, we're taking Rennes and then you can try and take it off of us. First of all, we have the advantage of the fact you're in a defensive position, which benefits you. And second of all, the Pope's going to be like, well, actually, England are the bad guys here. They've screwed you over, not the other way around. So we're actually going to denounce, um, or excommunicate, rather, England as opposed to you. And as I said, the difficult, in quotation marks, thing with France is there's a lot of factions surrounding them, and there are a lot of Catholic factions. That's good in the sense that you have a sort of insurance security thing where... Uh, you, you know, they're less likely to attack you early on because you're Catholic and they're Catholic, but also it means you're less likely to be able to attack them without the Pope getting mad. So what I would do, I probably have an alliance with one of these, and I think it's probably Spain because I wouldn't bother going down south first. Just get an alliance with Spain. The thing is, it's a relatively weak faction sometimes because they kind of get dogpiled by people. But you could get an alliance with the Holy Roman Empire, maybe, if you decided you don't want to expand that direction. Get an alliance with the Holy Roman Empire, then. It's a good idea to have an alliance with one of these factions that are around you. So you can focus your stuff on the rebels and then a Catholic faction eventually. So what, what would I do personally? Well... First of all, I would try and get into a situation where England declared war on you, so you don't look bad. Then, you have a sort of right, sort of, to go for this place, which I'm not going to pronounce because I know a word very similar, which, well, it sounds similar to in, in French anyway, to me it does, uh, which is pretty rude. So I won't pronounce that just in case I offend anyone, which I don't want to do particularly. This place, you can see it, is C-A-E-N, this place. Um, you can take that and then you really consolidate your empire. Then I would personally go for Britain, personally, because Britain is great just to go for because once you take it, nobody's going to take it off you, provided you kick the Scots out, of course. Nobody's going to take it off you. Like, nobody's going to bother. They just, they just don't. The fact that you're an island means you're in such a good defensive position. You're secure for life. Beautiful. Beautiful stuff. So, yeah, 
Personally, I'd go up there, but you could decide, and this is where it sort of goes down to whatever you want to do, you could decide to go for Spain. I personally wouldn't bother. I never bother going with Spain. I don't think it's that profitable for the amount of settlements that are spread out, and it's quite difficult. And it's three factions you'd have to go to war against. It's not ideal. I personally wouldn't. I personally wouldn't go for Spain. I would go for England, try and eliminate them. I wouldn't go for the Holy Roman Empire just because it's too much land in the centre. And again, if you expand in this territory, you've just got more factions around you then. You're now inviting Denmark, Poland, Hungary and Venice to attack you. Whereas if you expand maybe up here, well there's no rival factions apart from maybe Scotland. So you're kind of eliminating the amount of territory or the amount of factions around your border. So that's my sort of advice. And then you could potentially go and focus on the Italian factions uh, and sweep across Italy. More profitable because it's by the sea than areas around here in Central Europe which just aren't as good. In my opinion, my humble opinion, what do I know? So yeah, that's, that's a basic summary really. Consolidate what you've got, take the rebel settlements, it's a lot. You've got a big empire already, you can expand it very, very quickly and be by far the biggest empire very, very early on. Then I would personally go for Britain or England and Scotland rather than the Holy Roman Empire or Spain or Portugal. And that's my general advice, basically. So that's pretty much it for this faction guide of France. Uh, you can tell me which one you want to do next. I think the next one will be the Holy Roman Empire, actually. Unless somebody shouts and goes, look, I really want you to do, I don't know, um, Egypt or something. And I'll go, OK, I'll do Egypt. But the default next one will be Holy Roman Empire, unless anyone says differently. But thank you. I hope you enjoyed. And I'll see you around.